thank you so much, Alessio, for sharing us, uh, sharing with us the information on the application process. And let's move forward to the next portion of our uh, event today, and that is learning more about the UCAT and the BMAT exams, understanding the differences between them, and also learning about how to prepare for these exams more effectively. So passing it back to you, uh, Alessio. Great. Well, thank you for, for staying with us this morning, everybody. So what we've been through already is we've talked a little bit about an exposure to what it might involve to study medicine in the UK, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand. We then looked specifically at the UK application process. We talked about UCAS, um, for instance, in the personal statement. And when we went through um, the UK application process, obviously a theme that I kept mentioning was this UCAT and the BMAT. So what are these, these beasts, as it were? So this journey into medicine that we've been through already involves sitting two aptitude tests, the UCAT, typically around the age of 16, 17, and the BMAT around the age of 17, 18. You can only do these tests once per application cycle, and they are only valid for, excuse me, for one application cycle. Okay, so this is what we're referring to here. Now, whenever I'm... Um, teaching a course or speaking with individual students, some of the students ask me, you know what, how, why is it that we need to do aptitude tests? And ultimately what they're designed to be is fairer than school, um, school, school exams like the A-levels or the IB, and they test um, aptitude as well as your application of knowledge. So it's looking for some raw skills as well. Ultimately, although it may be slightly difficult to see this initially with some of the tests, they are designed to try and find the best potential doctors in these aptitude-based skills that they test in these um, exams are mirroring the, the raw skills and aptitude that you would need in your daily life as a doctor. So as we go through these tests, I'll start to give you a flavor of why these skills may be transferable to, to a career in medicine. So another question um, that comes up, and we've started answering this already today, is who uses what? So you can see the universities in the UK are indicated by blue here use the UCAT test. So um, you can see Aberdeen, Dundee, St Andrews, Edinburgh, Glasgow, all in Scotland requiring the, the um, UCAT, right down to Peninsula, Exeter, Southampton, uh, Kent Medway as well in the south of England. Um, in London, Kings, George's and Queen Mary require the UCAT. And you can see the vast majority of UK, UK medical schools need this UCAT test. Um, essentially what that means is that you can't avoid taking the UCAT when you're applying to study in the UK. In red, we can see the BMAT schools. So for instance, uh, UCL there, Brighton, Sussex, Lancaster, Leeds, um, all requiring the BMAT. So this is another summary table of the universities who will um, require the UCAT test. So for undergraduate medicine, you can see there's a quite a comprehensive list and this covers most of the students here. For graduate entry medicine, so remember we talked about the different pathways to studying medicine in the UK. You have that undergraduate route of five years or the graduate entry medicine route, which is typically a four-year course following an undergraduate degree. So you can see for the graduate courses in Birmingham, Queen Mary, Hull York, um, Sheffield, Kings, Southampton, Newcastle, and Warwick, you would also need the UCAT test. We've had a question come in already about dentistry and some dental schools in the UK do also require the UCAT test. So the UCAT stands for the University Clinical Aptitude Test, and this replaced the UK CAT in 2019. So that used to be called the United Kingdom Clinical Aptitude Test. And this is because the UCAT has since gone global. And as we've mentioned already, for example, there's now the UCAT ANZ, which is required by Australian and New Zealand universities. A good disclaimer to say now, is that the UCAT ANZ is exactly the same test, examines the, it's the same form of test as the UCAT in the UK. So for those of you who might also be considering studying medicine in Australia, this is also um, a relevant exam. Okay, the UCAT is of course required by the majority of medical schools and certainly pretty much all students who I've helped with their applications and who I've um, tutored with the Medic Portal have taken the UCAT test. It's a two hour computerized test typically sat in test centers. Now in the 2021 cycle, the current cycle, which is what my students are doing at the moment, uh, there's the option to sit the test online. We don't know how that's gonna to continue to be rolled out or if indeed it will be continued to roll out next year. 
students have to register and sit this test independently, and it can only be sat once per year, and it's only valid for one application cycle. So you can't take the UCAT early, as it were. You have to take the UCAT in that sort of summer before um, you launch your UCAS application. Coming in to do the UCAS, the UCAT in a, in a test center is quite similar in the UK, at least, to driving theory tests in that it's a public test center. So not everybody in the room with you will be taking the UCAT. There'll be people doing, as I say, driving theory, English language tests, et cetera, et cetera. So the key dates, of course, what I've given you here are the 2021 dates. However, these tend not to change so much year on year. So you would typically register and create your account to take the test in early June before booking goes live at the end of June. And testing dates, um, this year at least, ran from late July to late, so running until late September now. Now, this is a narrow window to what it is. Normally, typically testing starts a little bit earlier in July. And of course, testing dates may vary by center based on access and demand. So testing centers in India may um, have a narrow um, booking, or a narrow testing window, I should say, for instance. Now, an extra consideration here with the UCAT is because you register and take the test independently. It's important, obviously, to register early because you would like to um, get the booking for the exact date that you would like. But because you can choose when you take the test, you um, have a little bit of freedom here as to designing a schedule and planning your revision and test day in a manner that you think is going to give you the best result. So you would obviously need to consider any summer commitments. Do you have a part-time job in the summer, for instance? Any exams you may have to be prepared to prepare for on your return to school? Or, of course, it's important to take some time and have a holiday in the summer as well. Another consideration is also, will I be sitting the BMAP? Now, if you are thinking of taking the BMAP, and we're going to go into a little bit more information on the BMAP in the second part of this um, session, if you are considering taking the BMAP, I would recommend taking the UCAT a little bit earlier, purely because you, would, you need a little bit of a rest and a little bit of time to get your brain back into aptitude test gear and focus on the BMAP, because although it is also an aptitude test, it is subtly different to the UCAT. So revising for both at the same time, certainly this is what I recommend to my students, and what I found myself tends not to be the best um, course of action. So ultimately what this is, is a balancing act. Remember to leave enough time to revise, but don't uh, keep it too late. If you book your test and you decide, hmm, I think I maybe need another week of preparation, or you know what, I'm ready, I'm ready to set the test next week, there is also subject to availability, the opportunity to move your booking. So the, the test can be quite adaptable in that regard. Now, enough about the admin around the test. Let's start with what's in the UCAT. So the test always starts with verbal reasoning, goes to a decision-making section, a quantitative reasoning section, an abstract reasoning section, followed by situational judgment tests. And this running order is always the same, starting with verbal reasoning. Time varies for each section. And really, this exam, if you had unlimited time to take the UCAT exam, you guys are all smart students, you'd probably be able to get 100%. But the catch here is that they, the examiners put you under immense time pressure. So working around mitigating that time pressure is the, um, the key feature of this exam. And importantly as well, time cannot be carried on between the sections. So when we go through the timing, you'll see that the time is standard for each section. So you can't race through verbal reasoning and bank an extra five minutes to use on your abstract reasoning, because you can essentially think of this exam as being five mini examinations. So verbal reasoning, all about testing your comprehension skills, particularly um, sort of skim reading, targeted reading, looking for key words. And you can see where you might need verbal reasoning in a medical scenario could be um, as a doctor referring patient notes. You need to be able to pick out the key pieces of information to then inform your decision making and prepare for a consultation with a patient. The next section, decision making, well, medicine and dentistry even is all about decision making looking at the signs and symptoms that a patient presents with, whittling down your options to work out what an appropriate diagnosis might be, and that's all problem solving. Quantitative reasoning, testing some maths-based skills, and we can see how that might be relevant to career in medicine, working through drug calculations, for example. Abstract reasoning is one that students are slightly baffled with to begin with. This is all about pattern recognition. So typically, a typical abstract reasoning question will be where they give you a set A and a set B, and within set A and set B, there's different boxes containing different shapes that all conform 
to a similar or to the same pattern, and there'll be a similar patterns between set A and B. And now pattern recognition, and it's particularly um, sort of visual um, pattern recognition, is important in a medical scenario when we think of a doctor or um, looking at x-ray images or any type of imaging. You would need to be able to see patterns and tell between, for instance, a chest x-ray, tell between a normal chest x-ray or a chest x-ray that shows pathology, such as a pneumothorax. Um, situational judgment is slightly different to the other four sections in that the other four sections have a numerical score and situational judgment, you're given a banded score. And situational judgment tests come up a lot as part of um, medical um, applications, not only for medical school, but it was something in the UK at least, you take an SJT, a situational judgment test, at the your final year of medical school, and this helps your application for foundation year one jobs. Um, the in the situational judgment test, they're testing your softer skills, communication, empathy, ethical reasoning, through giving you a variety of different um, scenarios and asking you to rate how appropriate or important you think various actions to those scenarios are. Okay, so that's a just a, a verbal um, overview of the UCAT exam. We're going to now look at some different um, some of the different sections and talk about the nuts and bolts of this exam. I would say as a disclaimer right at the beginning, the best way to study for this exam is to get used to the exam format going through questions. So at the Medic Portal, we have our UCAT course, which gives you a great exposure to the theory. And I've been involved with some personal uh, tuition for students where we go through some really difficult questions, go through some different themes and talk about some of the ways um, that we can get around those questions and maximize their scores. So the way the scoring works in the UCAT, as we've alluded to, there's five sections. Now those first four sections, in each of the sections, you can score up to 900 points for, from between 300 and 900 points are on offer in each of the section. And this is like a UCAT score scaling, just to make sure that everyone fits nicely onto a bell curve. Then in the situational judgment test, this is a standalone score. So what you come out of the exam with is a cumulative score between 1200 to 3600 for the first four sections, then a band one to four in SJT, band one being the highest and a band two being the lowest. So of course, numerical scores, we can imagine how they might work. The band one to band four, essentially shows the degree of similarity that your answers to the situational judgment questions were to a panel of experts who were given the same questions. So a high level of agreement would lead to a band one score and disagreeing more than you agree would lead to a band four score. Now, when we start to look at average scores based on the year, we can see here, so this is from the past six application cycles. Um, you can see an average score in the first four sections is around 630 out of 900. Um, so if we were to be, for example, scoring 700 above, we suddenly become a really competitive applicant. And you can see highlighted in red there that the verbal reasoning is typically the lowest score. And this tends to be because students applying for medical courses, generally speaking, um, are doing science subjects at school and are a little bit out of practice when it comes to the more English-based skills of comprehension, et cetera. Now, here are some of the scores um, by year for the situational judgment test. So we can see the vast majority of students uh, in these past six application cycles, you can see these um, 30s and 40s percent are scoring a band one to two in the SJT there. So that's really where we need to try and be to be as competitive as possible with our application. Um, okay. So that obviously begs the question next of what is a good score? Now, we can see some of the decile rankings here. Um, when you get your UCAT score, you obviously find out your individual score, and you can look at previous years to see where your score might fit in the decile ranking of previous years, which is where they group the whole cohort who took the UCAT that year into 10% brackets. So obviously, we'd love to be in this ninth decile. This is the top 10%. And you can see in 2020, so last application cycle, this was um, the, the average score per section you needed was 712.5 to be in that top 10%, which is, of course, what we'd all love to aim for. Um, and we saw similar um, statistics here on the SJT. So you can see most students scoring between a band one and a band two. Um, and obviously, we don't need to refer back to previous years because we know what a band one or a band two means for the SJT. 
Now, importantly as well, and this is what I alluded to earlier when I talked about how we can use the UCAT to be a strategical application. This is because different medical schools have different policies for how they use the UCAT. Some of, some of them will rank all their applicants by the UCAT score. Some offer a points allocation for different groups. Some universities offer, operate off a minimum cutoffs. For example, St. George's used to have a minimum cutoff score for each section that was required. Some use the UCAT less than others, and they'll only use it in borderline cases. And some, of course, universities don't use it at all because they tend to be the BMAT universities. Ultimately, and particularly when we're preparing for this exam to consider, the higher your score, the better your chances of maximizing your application. So essentially, we can group medical schools based on whether they put a high or a low emphasis on the UCAT exam. And this is really important because you come out of this UCAT exam with your score. You're given your score as a printout as soon as you leave the exam room. So what you can do is you can then look at previous application cycles and go off the data from previous years and start to look at where you think your score gives you the best chance of securing an interview. And that's how the UCAT can be used strategically. And this is one of the big differences between the UCAT and the BMAT, because you um, sit the BMAT exam after you've already submitted your UCAS application. Now, the timings um, in the UCAT, so bearing in mind that all of these timings include a one minute of reading time. So the standard UCAT test has 20 minutes for the verbal reasoning section, 32 minutes for decision making, 25 minutes for quantitative reasoning, 14 minutes for abstract reasoning, and 27 minutes for the SJT, so giving a two hour exam in total. Now, if you have extra time, for instance, at school exams or public examinations, you could also apply to take the UCAT with extra time. And this is called the UCAT SEN test. And here you can see that there's an extra half an hour split over the various sections coming to a two and a half hour exam. Remember that all of these timings include a one minute of reading time. So actually, for instance, in decision making, you actually have 31 minutes of question time. Okay, so this is a little bit more inf information on the UK SEN. So if, for example, in your school exam, you're entitled to extra time breaks or accommodations, um, you could apply for this uh, test equally if you have specific learning disabilities. Um, importantly, you must apply 10 working days before the test, giving thorough proof of entitlement um, and some other special access options, which may require additional approval, include a 50% extra time, getting five minute break between sections, having access to medical items that are not on the UCAT's pre-published comfort aid list or special access arrangement for your arrangements for your testing center. Right, we are gonna go through and give a brief introduction to the different sections, but it's important now to give a, an introduction to how you can go about preparing for the UCAT exam. At the Medic Portal, our strategy typically splits preparation for the UCAT into three stages. The first one is all about understanding and getting an idea of the underlying theory before you start applying that theory and consolidating that theory by loads of practice questions. Now, firstly, it's important to learn the theory. So you could use the UCAT website where there's some practice questions. TMP stands for the Medic Portal and that's us. On our website, you'll find access um, to some uh, blog posts talking about the exam. We also have access to our own courses, so we teach um, online courses. Um, indeed, we have an online course that you can work through in a self-directed manner. Um, there's also, for those of you more local, there are in-person courses as well. And we also have books on our, um, a theory book as well. There's also books on, um, on the web, on the internet that you might find to help prepare. However, because this is a two hour computerized test, it's really important that you complete most of your practice online, simulating the way that the exam will be sat. So I would recommend using our online question bank, which gives a sort of realistic UCAT interface and has the exact same layout as what you'll come and find on test day. So that's all about understanding, learning that underlying theory, knowing what uh, is being examined in this test. Next comes the application where you apply your knowledge. And this can be using the UCAT online question bank, or indeed, as I've mentioned already, our medic portal online question bank. Okay, and you can consolidate using timed online mocks. There are a couple of UCAT official mocks on the website. And then in, as part of our online question bank through the Medic Portal, we have our own online mocks that are the same difficulty, the same exam as what you, will, uh, you would see on test day as well. So really useful revision aid there. 
Now, the UCA official guide has this quote here where they say that spend around 21 to 30 hours in preparation for the UCAT. This is the amount of preparation done by the highest scoring respondents to our survey. Personally, and in my experience of working with students applying, um, preparing to take this exam, as well as my own experience, I think that this is a little bit conservative and you would probably be needing to spend around 50 hours in preparation. It's a tricky exam and you need to expose yourself to as many practice questions as possible to properly get your head around how, we, um, how to score well in this exam. Right, so we've talked about an overview of the various sections, and now I'm going to start talking about verbal reasoning in a little bit more detail. So remember, this is the first section when you come in on test day. Now, the UCAT people say that verbal reasoning tests as, and assesses your ability to think and, and read carefully about information presented in passages and to determine whether specific conclusions can be drawn from the information presented. Now, an overview of this section is, of course, that's testing um, your ability to understand and interpret written information quickly. As I mentioned already, a doctor may need to do when they go through a patient's health records or a referral letter. In the exam, you'll be asked to quickly read 11 short passages of text. As a springboard from those passages of text, you'll be asked to identify key pieces of information and draw some correct conclusions from that information. Okay. That sounds a little bit abstract here. I will show you and flash up an example question just so you have an idea of the layout um, in a couple of slides time. So the key stats, what are the numbers around verbal reasoning? Well, as I said, there's 11 question sets and each of those question sets has four items, which gives you 44 items in total. And an item is a statement with its associated answer options. So essentially a multiple choice set we could think of as an item. The test, as I mentioned, is 22 minutes um, in duration, but that includes a one minute of reading time. So it's 21 minutes of question time, which gives you almost two minutes per set or 28.6 seconds per item, which is extreme time pressure. Yeah, as I said, the recurring theme with the UCAT is how difficult it is to complete what's required of you in the time allowed. So you can see this is what a screenshot of a typical UCAT verbal reasoning question may look like. So we can see our passage on here on the left here in our information area. We can see um, an item here. So for example, this one is a, is a statement here and we're asked whether it's true, false or can't tell. So we have 28.6 seconds to assess whether this statement is true, false or can't tell based on this passage. So it's all about doing a targeted read and picking out our key words and sticking brutally to the time limit. Okay, so the passage will be 200 to 400 words. This is the passage here. Um, and there's two different types of question format in the UCAT verbal reasoning. There's the older and slightly easier true, false, can't tell format. And if I just go back one slide again, this is what this um, example question was, a true, false, can't tell. Okay, so you're basing all of your answers off the information in the passage. And you're asking, you're, being, you're asking or answering, I should say, whether a statement is true, false, or you based on the information in the, in the passage, you cannot tell whether it's true or false. And we're going off a principle of what logically follows, which means that you cannot help but make a conclusion without making any assumptions. So the overarching point that I'm trying to come get across here is that it's important to base your answer solely on the terms of the passage, not any prior knowledge that you may have. The other type of UCAT verbal reasoning question is a comprehension style which is where, um, again, you'll have four items and they can be questions or statements. And these are the four items associated with a specific passage. And what makes a comprehension question slightly harder is that there's more information to assimilate because rather than your answer options simply being true, false, or can't tell, you'll be given four free text answer options. So more information to go through and more keywords to pick out for your targeted read. So this is what, um, a strategic approach might look like for a verbal reasoning question. So once you um, are in the test, you're flicking through, you're on your computer, and you flash up a verbal reasoning question, you would need to look out for keywords in the question in that item, and then refer back to the passage looking for a targeted read, picking out those keywords. So don't try to read the entire passage, because what that's going to do is that's going to waste precious time, and it's time that you don't need to spend. You simply won't have time to read that entire passage. So we do a targeted read, like a skim read through the passage, 
looking for keywords that we've identified in the item. And once you've found a keyword in the passage, that would be where you find the information to then use to assess whether an item, for instance, is true, false, or can't tell, or to answer a comprehension style of question. So again, another example here, we've got this, um, we've got this passage here, and we've got the statement, the Great Gatsby is fictional with no basis in reality. So we would need to look out for some keywords. So a keyword might be a name, the Great Gatsby, and then we could look at um, another keyword being fictional. So it does it at any point here reference whether, whether the story is um, non-fiction or fiction, or is it real or not? So we can look at some keywords from that item and then do a targeted read through the passage sort of skim reading and trying to find out those key words. Okay. Perfect. So that was an introduction to the first section of the exam. So the first of the five sections, which is verbal reasoning. Now, the second section that you'll encounter on test day is decision making. Now, the UCAT people say that decision making, this subtest assesses your ability to apply logic to reach a decision or conclusion, how, assesses how well you evaluate arguments and how well you analyze statistical information. Again, there's multiple question formats. You are allotted 29 questions in 31 minutes, but that's obviously 30 minutes of question time, so slightly over one minute per question. Unlike verbal reasoning, which is where you don't take any knowledge in and you answer all the questions solely based off the terms of the passage, decision-making does require some knowledge. Now, an overview of this section, what are the numbers involved? Well, it's designed to test um, your decision-making in three domains. You'll be asked questions around surrounding deductive reasoning. So often they involve um, logical puzzles, like um, you'll have a group of dogs and you're told that dog A is taller than dog B, dog um, D is smaller than dog E, but in between A and B. Um, and you would need to, for instance, work out the size order of the dogs, deductive reasoning, going off and um, reaching a conclusion based on the premises that you're given in the question. You may be asked to evaluate arguments. So you're given um, an argument, and you may be asked um, which of these is the strongest argument, evaluating how strong an argument might be. Statistical and figural reasoning often comes up a lot, so that's probability as well as how well you can answer a question based off a graph or a confusing pie chart, for instance, or a Venn diagram style of question. So unlike the other sections of the UCAT, you do need to bring some knowledge in with you for this decision-making section. So you would need to have an understanding of your basic maths, Venn diagrams, as well as probability. You're given 29 items, and again, you have 31 minutes of question time, so it comes to around 64 seconds per question. So although it's still time pressured, it's slightly less time pressured than verbal reasoning, which has half the time per question. So this is an example of what a decision-making um, question might look like. So you're given a sort of puzzle here, and you'd be asked which symbol does the question mark represent. The correct answer here would be a heart, but this is simply to illustrate um, one of those problem-solving style of questions, just so you get an example of what it looks like. So moving to the third section of the exam, and this is um, the quantitative reasoning. Now, the UCAT people say that quantitative reasoning assesses your ability to use numerical skills to solve problems, it assumes familiarity with numbers to withstand with a good pass at GCSE. And GCSE is an exam that UK students take at the age of 16, so in their third last year of high school. However, items are less to do with numerical facility and more to do with problem solving. So it's not really a maths test. What it is, is integrating maths within problem solving. And most students who I um, work with tend to find that this section is a little bit more accessible than some of the other ones. Decision making is also quite accessible whereas verbal reasoning and abstract reasoning do require quite a lot of work, and most of my students ask me to spend most of our time in our lessons going over those sections with them. Okay, again, dealing with numbers here. Right. Okay, so an overview of the quantitative reasoning section. In this exam, or this subtest, I should say, you'll be posed with nine scenarios, each containing four questions leaving 36 questions in total. You're given 25 minutes, but of course, subtracting that one minute reading time leaves you 24 minutes for this section, which arrives at 40 seconds per question, which is quite time pressured. 
Now, information in these scenarios that you will be asked questions based off, the information might be presented as tables and graphs, charts and pie charts, two and three dimensional shapes, diagrams, as well as some text-based um, information. And each question will involve five possible answers, including a can't tell option. So this is a bit of a tricky one to include there because they'll give you some information in the scenario, asking a follow-up question, so you need to be really careful in terms of whether or not you select can't tell, okay? Because often there is a way to work out um, how to answer the question. So some common concepts to come up in quantitative reasoning. I'm sure you guys all study maths at school. Um, these will be familiar to you, but percentages, fractions, and decimals, they love percentage change in this exam. So knowing it's um, difference over the original times 100, really important. Ratios, currency conversions, um, unit conversions as well, so kilometers to miles, they might tell you. Uh, they'll always they'll give you the conversion. But these conversions, percentage changes come up a lot. Interest rates, compound interest, speed, distance time graphs, volumes, um, areas and volumes, mean, median, and mode. So all the reasonably basic maths uh, concepts, but they will come under the guise of quite difficult problem-solving scenarios. Okay, so. An example here of a um, quantitative reasoning style of question. So we can see a, a scenario here talking about this guy, Robert's monthly expenses in several categories for June and July. And we can see the information is presented as a pie chart here, okay, broken into the different facets of his spending. And then we're asked a question which follows on from that um, example, from that scenario, I should say. Okay, so abstract reasoning. Now, abstract reasoning is tough. And this is all about pattern recognition. And certainly when I was preparing for this exam, as well as the, the lots of students that I've tutored and on courses, et cetera, most students come out of a course or a tuition and say, you know what, this is the section I think I need to spend the most time getting my head around. So the UCAT people, again, they say uh, abstract reasoning assesses your ability to identify patterns amongst abstract shapes where irrelevant and distracting material may lead to incorrect conclusions. So an overview of this section. Abstract reasoning is all about testing your spatial reasoning, assessing how good you are at identifying patterns, how you ignore distracting materials. And this is, of course, important as a doctor because you need to focus on the signs and symptoms that are most relevant to the patient without being taken on a tangent. And because you're looking to find a pattern, it's all about developing and modifying a hypothesis. And of course, this is something that is key in medicine because you're constantly working on a, on a differential diagnosis and you're modifying what your diagnosis might be as test results come in, as you receive more information from your patient, et cetera. And there are four types of question in this abstract reasoning. Okay, we have um, type one and type four questions where you're given a set A and a set B with a pattern that's um, linking all boxes within a set A and set B, or you have, um, you're being asked which shape might complete a sequence, or you may be asked for associations between shapes. There's 55 questions in this section. You have 14 minutes for it. So 13 minutes of question time, taking into account that one minute reading time, which leaves under 70 seconds per question set of five or 14 seconds per question, which is quite horrific time pressure. But there are definitely some strategies to use to mitigate that time pressure. And if you're interested in finding more about those strategies, do have a look at our online uh, course. Um, and it, it would be that a live session or the self-directed one and have a look at our question bank as well. So this is an example of what a type one question look like, looks like. So I've alluded to um, the set A and set B here. So you can see in set A, there's six different boxes and there will be a pattern that links all of these boxes. So the shapes within these boxes, so for example, this is one box, they're not random, they're there because they conform to the pattern. And there'll be a similar reciprocal as it were pattern in set B. So we can see here the pattern in set A is that all of the boxes contain a shaded square. So you can see there's a shaded square there. There's one in this top right, another shaded square, another shaded square, shaded square, and a shaded square. Meanwhile, in set B, hopefully some of you have already identified that in set B, all of the boxes contain an unshaded circle. Let's see, there. Now, this is a relatively easy pattern. There are plenty more complicated patterns out there and you would have um, essentially 14 seconds for each one of these questions. So you would uh, be given this test shape and be asked to say, does it belong in set A or B, or does it belong in neither? 
Okay, that's how abstract reasoning works. And that's an example of the type one questions, which are typically the questions that most of my students find a little bit more challenging. Right, so we've introduced abstract reasoning. We're now gonna move on and have a look at the situational judgment test. Now, the SJT, situational judgment test, is all about measuring your capacity to understand real world situations and to identify critical factors and appropriate behavior in dealing with them. So it's, it's looking at soft skills. This is rather than raw academic knowledge, this is assessing how well you respond to certain scenarios that may be thrown at you, not only as a medical student, but as a doctor later down the line. Ultimately, you're gonna to need to make this decision between whether a response or an action is wrong or if it's right and how wrong or how right an action may be. Situational judgment tests are a recurring theme, particularly in the UK, and they're widely used in medicine. So not only will you need to do um, an SJT as part of your medical school application for the UK, as part of the UCAT, um, in your final year of medical school, you make an application for your foundation year one. So that's your first year working as a doctor. And as part of that job application, you will need to complete an SJT test. And then again, should you decide that you'd like to become a general practitioner, you would need to take another SJT as part of the application for those training roles. So a situational judgment test, what it does is it presents students with a range of different situations they might encounter now, or indeed in their future work environment. And as a follow on, there'll be a number of possible actions suggested. Okay, so you'll be told who the players are in these scenarios, and then you'll be given a detail of who, which character, is um, completing these actions or responses. And what you need to do is, depending on the question type, you may need to rate how appropriate or important an action can be. And these are the two different question types in the situational judgment. So in appropriateness question, you may be asked, um, you'll be asked to rank whether the response is very appropriate, appropriate but not ideal, inappropriate but not awful, or, inappro or completely um, inappropriate. And the important style of questions, you'll be asked whether an action is very important, important, of minor importance, or not important at all. And this test is all about measuring your capacity to understand these real world situations, to appreciate the gravitas of the scenarios, and to identify critical factors and appropriate behavior in how we deal with these scenarios and the responses that stem on from them. So the, what are the, the numbers involved with this? So there's 69 items across 22 scenarios, with each scenario getting between two and five associated questions, 26 minutes of question time, so 27 minus that one minute reading time, leaving 23 seconds per question. Now, this sounds like it should be time pressured. However, certainly most of my students don't find the SJT to be as time pressured as some of the other sections. And the three types of question that you can be posed with are rating the appropriateness of a response, rating the importance of response, and that's what I've been through already here, or you may be asked to drag and drop to rank the importance of various responses. And your score is given as a band. So where the first four um, sections, as I alluded to before, have that numerical score from 300 to 900 points per section, the SJT, you're given a banded score. Band one is the best score, and band four is the worst score. So what happens, these massive database of UCAT SJT questions are given to a panel of experts, and they include uh, doctors, teachers, any sort of prof professional, and they provide their answers. And they essentially serve as the marking scheme. So your answer and your collection of answers from your SJT test is allocated to a band based essentially on the degree of agreement um, between your responses and those responses of the panel of experts. So those students who score in a band one are showing um, exceptional um, agreement with the panel of experts. However, those students scoring a band four are disagreeing with the experts a little bit more than they're agreeing with the experts. So ultimately what's being tested here? Now the situational judgment test um, is used to test for those non-academic attributes. So they include questions that may relate to honesty and integrity. It's important in a hospital to never lie because we need to be making sure that we're building rapport and ensuring trust between the doctor and their patient. Um, pressure and prioritization is really important. As a doctor and indeed as a medical student, you'll have a huge um, demand on your time and you need to be able to rank and prioritize tasks based on what needs to be done um, here and now and what's more important. Communication skills. 
how we effectively communicate within a team and how you would communicate as a leader can also come up in the SJT, as well as generally how you would show your commitment to a team or how you could be the best leader in a scenario. Ethical and moral dilemmas may come up as well. Okay, for instance, you may find that you see another um, colleague um, stealing medication from a ward. Um, how do you respond? Ultimately, a key thing to remember in the UCAT um, SJT is that patient safety must be preferred, but um, preserved. So you need to take actions that ensure patient safety, meaning that actions which um, reduce patient safety will generally be inappropriate or um, certainly not important at all to do. So this is an example of a um, UCAT SJT question. So you can see here we have our scenario and we're told this is about Jane, who's a foundation trainee. So she's just left medical school working as a doctor. Okay, we're given some sort of dilemma that's happening in the scenario. And then we're given her response, which in this case is leaving on time to make sure she catches the flight. And we need to rank whether that response is appropriate. I mean, it's a very appropriate thing to do, an appropriate but not ideal, inappropriate but not awful, or a very inappropriate thing to do. So we've been through the different sections of the UCAT. Again, this is a whistle stop tour, and I would strongly recommend having a look on our website. And if you're thinking about looking for help for all facets, of the application, I would strongly recommend our Bespokes package, which is something that I personally tutor on, and I've had a few students receive some great success in their application through that Bespoke package. So once you fully understand the theory and strategies for each question type, it's all about practice. So remember to segment your practice and practice only one area of the UCAT at a time. You may like to cover all the different sections in a day, but in a session, as it were, focusing on one section. Don't worry too much about the time conditions at the beginning. However, it becomes closer to test day. Once we've finalized our accuracy without too much time pressure, it's important to start adding that time pressure on because that really does start to sort the stronger applicants from the weaker applicants in this test. So once we've got our theory down pat and we've been learning of how to apply and we've been going through our practice questions, it's then all about um, consolidating with time blocks. So this is, of course, once you've practiced applying the theory to the questions, we need to get real and see what a mock might look like. So there it's important to work through mocks in real time conditions. Of course, this is all about giving you an exposure to the real deal of the exam day and um, filling you with confidence that managing different question types as well as focusing on your time management. So preparing you to be best set up for test day. In your preparation, I would strongly recommend monitoring and tracking your performance across the time mocks. This will let you know which sections you're finding more difficult and often it's encouraging just to see a general upward trend. It's important to also use the online question bank to enable you to practice um, thousands of questions with model answers. And we have a question bank on our website, which includes UK and SEN mocks. So you can see this is the screenshot here. So have a look at us, um, the Medic portal online, and you can get access to our question bank from the website. Okay, so that's what I um, wanted to discuss concerning the BMAT. Um, Devesh, might it be a good opportunity now to take um, some questions on the UCAT before I move on to the BMAT? All right, great. So the first question is, is it, uh, how important is it to get a good score in BMAT or UCAT uh, for admissions in the medical universities? I would say it's paramount. So really, the everybody applying to medical school is a, is a smart student. So everybody applying to medical school will have terrific grades leaving school um, and those sorts of things. So the aptitude test is really the common ground. And it's the one um, sort of area of the application that is, re that is really fair between all the students. Um, so I would say that it's important to score well purely because it's a brilliant way of differentiating yourself. And they do form a fundamental part of allocations for interviews, et cetera. So that would be my answer to that one, Devesh. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for answering that. My next question is, do students who have some learning differences or dys dyslexia, do they get some additional time or some exam concessions while they are taking the UCAT or the BMAT test? They, they do indeed. And it would, um, what I can do here, I mean, let me just scroll back because I had a specific slide that did cover that. Mm -hmm. um, so let me see if I can, I'll just flick back a little bit and we can just quickly show for the, for the student asking that question what that would involve. 
here. So you can see you could apply um, to take the UCAT using the UCAT SEN. And if you have 25% extra time in public exams, this is what the UCAT SEN involves. Equally, if you have additional access options, you could look at the UCAT SEN 50 or these alternate versions of the UCAT that should hopefully provide for any um, um, additional requirements there. Okay, perfect. My next question is, is UCAT and the UCAT ANZ the same test or the same kind of test? So they are the same test in terms of um, what is assessed. However, importantly to remember, it's difficult to class the UCAT as being the same or different test because as I mentioned, they have this online database of loads of different um, UCAT questions and then you receive a personalized version of that in your exam. So nobody actually sits the exact same test. Everybody always sits the UCAT and the tests are standardized. So they will be the same level of difficulty. And the UCAT A and Z is no different in that regard to the UCAT in that somebody's UCAT A and Z test could equally be someone else's UCAT test. Okay, wonderful. Okay. And uh, can students take this test multiple times? Of course, we know they can take it only just once a year, but if they don't, if they're not happy with their score that year, can they just go ahead and take it the next year as well? They can indeed, but important to remember that you can only take one test per application cycle and your test is only valid for your particular application cycle. Fantastic. Okay. So if you take the test in 2021, but are applying um, a sending application in 2022, then you would need to do the 2022 UCAP. Wonderful. So I think we're ready to move ahead with BMAT uh, before we start the final part, that is the MMIs. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. So we've talked about the UCAP. Um, essentially, it's difficult to avoid taking the UCAP because the vast majority of medical schools do require it. However, there are medical schools that require the BMAT test, and that's what we're going to uh, go into and start talking about now. So the BMAT stands for the Biomedical Aptitude Test, and it's a two-hour pen and paper test. Unlike the UCAP, which doesn't really involve much knowledge, the BMAT looks to combine knowledge and aptitude into its exam. So this is all about focusing on using logic and applying existing knowledge. Like the UCAT, the BMAT is an aptitude test designed to find the best potential doctors, and it's divided into three sections. So you've got section one, about critical thinking and problem solving, section two, which is scientific knowledge and application, and section three is a writing task, a short essay. Now, important admin here, which universities require the BMAP? So we can see that um, for dentistry, it's Leeds, for biomedical sciences, it's Oxford, and the BMAP for medicine is required by Oxford, Leeds, Cambridge, Lancaster, Brighton, UCI, and Imperial. There are some other universities around the world that do take the BMAP as well, but we're looking at the UK here. Now, the asterisk you can see on the table relates to Keele and Manchester. So for local students, UK-based students, Keele and Manchester request uh, the UCAT test. However, international applicants to these two universities would be required to take the BMAT. So that's definitely something to be aware of, particularly as I imagine um, many of you guys coming from India will be um, international students, which is great. So a further admin concerning the BMAT, when and where is it taken? Now, unlike the UCAT, which we remember you have to book individually and um, take it in a sort of public test center, as it were, the BMAT tends to be taken at your school. Sometimes it can be at a local test center. Like the UCAT, the result is only valid for one year, and you can only sit it once per application cycle. Now, for the past couple of years, there's been two sittings of the, of the, of the BMAT, so you can choose which one you do. They have recently introduced a September sitting, and the September sitting means that you can um, receive your result before you launch a UCAS application, which is helpful. However, most students still tend to take their UCAT, uh, their BMAT, sorry, in November, purely to give them a little bit more time after taking the UCAT. If you're taking the November BMAT, then you have already submitted your UCAS application. However, I personally chose to take my UCAT, uh, my BMAT, sorry, in um, November, because that allowed sufficient time after the UCAT to sort of rest, recharge, finish my personal statement, submit my application, and gear up for the BMAT. In um, 2021, they've canceled the early sitting as a result of some COVID mitigations, um, and the test this year is being taken on November 3rd. Typically, registration takes place in September, so it's important because normally it's reg registration that happens through your school. Okay, so it's important that your school is aware that you would like to take the BMAT. Right, BMAT scoring. So for sections one and two, so section one I've mentioned already is that critical thinking 
and problem solving section. And section two is our scientific knowledge and application. These are all multiple choice questions where each question, um, so there's 60 questions um, or just under 60 questions in section one and around just under 30 questions in section two. Every question of those is worth one mark. And then your total mark, um, your raw score becomes scaled to this nine point BMAT scale. There's no negative marking in either the BMAT or the UCAT. So you're crazy to leave a question blank in any of these um, tests, even if it's just a guess. Put one down because you've got to be in it to win it. And who knows, your lucky guess may be true. Um, the BMAT scale ranges from one to nine. Now, a typical successful candidate in terms of securing an interview um, scores five. The best candidates are scoring six and above. And there are a few exceptional candidates who score above a seven. So we really want to be aiming for a 6.5 to be super competitive with our BMAT score. For section three, it's subtly different to the other two. So remember section three is the essay section. And for, for the essay, you'll, you get two scores. You get one facet of the score, which is an alphabetical score, um, where you graded in A to E for your quality of English, or you may have a numerical score, um, or you not may, you will have a numerical score accompanying that, which is graded from one to five for the quality of your content. So when you come out of the exam, you'll get a score from one to nine for section one, a score from one to nine for section two, and a score from section three, which will include, for example, a 4A score. So a numerical score for the quality of your content and an alphabetical score for the quality of your English. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the different sections. Section one, first of all. Section one, you're given 60 minutes and 32 MCQ, multiple choice questions leaving just under two minutes um, per question. And the types of questions that you'll come up in section one include mathematical, verbal, and spatial reasoning questions. And this is a test of your aptitude and skills. So they're looking for how you adapt to generic problem solving skills, how you understand arguments, how you use your data analysis and inference skills. And the types of question that they assess these aptitude and skills under are either problem solving or critical thinking style questions. So problem solving questions, obviously you need to have your thinking cap on for these. And these comprise 16, so half of the questions in section one. And this is all about assessing your ability to use logic and basic mathematical principles to solve problems. You need to think on the spot to, to figure out principles and some typical question types can include speed, no, uh, distance and time questions, questions manipulating pin numbers or alphabet style questions, partial table questions, logical reasoning, sequences and rules, as well as some spatial reasoning can come up here as well. So this is an example of a spatial reasoning question. So you can see based on the structure there, you're being asked, assuming all three dimensional block boxes below are the same size, how many boxes make up the structure below? Okay, and of course, looking at some hidden shapes that we may see kind of behind these ones there, we can conclude that that would be eight. So that was a problem solving example. The other half of uh, section one is critical thinking. And most students tend to find this one a little bit more difficult. So it would require a little bit more theory drilling to get used to this style of question. Okay, so critical thinking will comprise half of section one. And this is all about testing your understanding of arguments. So from the BMAT section one question guide, which can be found on the BMAT website, they say that the skill of critical thinking is essential for many areas of academic study and often involves considering argument put forward to promote or defend a particular point of view. Whatever the subject of study, it is necessary to answer the arguments presented by others and to be able to assess whether their arguments establish their claims. So essentially, you're being asked to assess argument strength, whether there's flaws in the argument. So they're questions that need a solid foundation in what the structure of an argument involves and what the structure of an argument might look like. So you can see here, you get this um, reasonably short passage that you have enough time to read thoroughly. And then you're being asked, in the case of this question, which of the following can be drawn as a conclusion from the passage? So drawing a conclusion from this argument here is the, is the question you're being asked. Okay. So some top tips when it comes to preparing for section one. So for problem solving, it's important to read the question carefully and use the data presented to you carefully. Pay attention to units um, on a table, for instance. Because obviously time is of the essence and there's no calculator for this exam, 
finding shortcuts is obviously quite important because you need to make sure that you're using uh, your time as effectively as possible. You should also establish and use simple calculations wherever possible. Again, the mitigating factor being that you do not have a calculator. When it comes to critical thinking, on the other hand, it's important to understand the different elements of an argument. Remember that premises um, can be added, move to strengthen or weaken an argument. So you'll often be asked, um, one of your answer options may be an additional premise, a piece of information that may strengthen or weaken an argument. And you need to think of how um, that has an impact on the text of the argument that you've read prior. It's important to also read the question, the passage, and then answer the, uh, answer the questions. This is unlike some of the strategies that we recommend in the UCAP. Of course, read the question carefully. Critical thinking does require careful thought and careful decision-making when choosing between different answer options. Okay, let's move on now and discuss section two. So section two is a scientific knowledge and application. Hurrah, because science is something that most students tend to have a good, a good grasp of and it tends to be something that they are able to work well with. So section two does require knowledge and specifically the knowledge that you'll need is um, key state. Uh, there's 27 questions in this section. Um, so the 27 is standing for there. And it's gonna be 27 key stage four, in other words, GCSE, so age 16 approximate level questions in maths, so six of those 27 questions. Physics, seven of the 27. Chemistry, seven of the 27 questions. And biology, another seven of the 27 questions. Leave me a total of 30 minutes for this section. So you get a little over a minute, 66 seconds per each of these questions. So an example question here from the physics type might be, I have some tea I would like to keep hot. And you're being asked which container would be best um, to put the tea in. So you're working off your physics principles of um, energy and energy conduction, convection, et cetera. So some top tips when it comes to preparing for section two of this exam. It's important to familiarize yourself with common topics and concepts for each science at a GCSE of 16, age 16 level. Learn the key formulae and their associated units. Units is a classic way that the UCAT people like to make this test challenging and like to trip some people up to sort the top applicants from the weaker applicants. There's an online science guide which you can use in tandem with the BMAT syllabus to map your revision. These are both available on the BMAT website. It's also important to pay close attention to your units and orders of magnitude. Remember, of course, that you should never leave a question unanswered. This goes for both aptitude tests, the BMAT as well as its um, sort of sister test in the UCAT. There's no negative marking. So whenever you think you're not 100% sure about a question, I would still strongly recommend putting a guess and moving on because you've got to be in it to win it. Right, so we've talk, talked through section one and we've talked through section two. Let's go through section three, which is all about the essay style. Okay. So section three is your essay. And in this section, you'll get a choice of three essay questions. You have to answer one of these and you get 30 minutes to do so. A really um, key feature of the BMAT is that your essay has to fit into one sheet of A4 paper. And importantly, because they're testing how well you plan your time, you're, um, you're only given one of these answer sheets. Okay, so it's handwritten on there. If you were, say, answering question two out of three to begin with, remember you only answer one of the questions, and you got to here answering question two, but then you decided actually you think you'd prefer perform better answering question three, you would only have the remaining space to write your answer for, for question three. So you do need to make sure that you think clearly about how you're structuring your arguments, that you write concisely, cogently, clearly, and that you answer the question directly because you don't have a lot of time. Planning as a result is really important. And even though you're writing an essay in 30 minutes, there is still sufficient time to plan for this section three section. So the BMAP people say that the essay writing task test your ability to select, develop, and organize ideas and communicate them in writing using a concise and effective manner. So the approach for section three um, is to remember that there's, there's normally going to be three subparts of one of those questions, and they almost always ask for the same things. So as a result, we can go off what the standard question type is, and we can learn some techniques for how to approach the, the question type. 
So the way the essay works is that you'll be given a statement and then you'll be asked to firstly explain what the statement means. And this is only short, one to two sentences. You'll then be asked to argue objectively. So normally the examiner will say, present arguments against the statement. And this is normally five to eight sentences. And then finally, you'll be asked to argue subjectively. So they'll ask you where you stand. So you would need to mitigate um, the objective arguments to provide the other side of the argument to balance it out. You would then need to reach a balanced conclusion before supplying your subjective um, opinion. Okay, so what um, it boils down to is a what may initially look like totally different question, questions in terms of the three questions that you're offered. When you boil it down to what specifically you're being asked to do based on those question types, the essay can become quite formulaic because the first part is all about that explain it, then you'll be asked to argue objectively, and then you'll argue um, subjectively. So some example statements that have come up in previous years, um, I can show you on screen now. So the first one here, Rosalind Franklin said that science gives only a partial explanation of life. You may then be asked to explain what Rosalind Franklin meant in this statement. You could then be asked to argue to the contrary that science gives a complete explanation of life. And then you may be asked, um, do you how, to what extent do you agree with the statement? And you can see that that breaks down into that explain it, objective argument, followed by subjective argument. Another example statement here, in the age of modern healthcare, every time a patient dies after a routine operation or procedure, it's a case of medical error. Again, three-pronged that question most likely. Another statement example, when you want to know how things really work, study them when they're coming apart. So that might link nicely into giving it an example about the anatomy lab. And then a final example here, liberty consists in doing what one desires. Okay, so you can see there's quite wide reaching in terms of the statements that you could be given. Some of them are gonna be a little bit more philosophical, others more sciencey. However, normally the follow-up questions will be similar. That explain it, objective, subjective argument. A quick guide for how you could budget your answer length. So remember you only get that one side of paper, so it's not a lot of um, space. The total length of the essay will tend to be between 280 to 400 words, and you could break that down into even 11 to 18 sentences. The first part, the explain it part, typically takes between 20 to 40 words or one to two sentences before your objective argument is normally this, um, 130 to 180 words, five to eight sentences, and then a subjective argument of 130, 180 words or five to eight sentences, following up with that nice balanced conclusion, giving your subjective opinion. So as far as preparing for the BMAT is concerned, we typically say at the medic portal, and from my experience in working with students as well, this tends to hold true, is that the exam requires eight weeks of preparation. So if we're working back from when you would take the UCAT, you do need to um, launch into that consideration as well. Don't overlook the sciences, so make sure that you have the knowledge. Go back and revisit some um, high school science and maths that you learned a couple of years ago, but have grown a bit rusty on. There's loads of free resources as well. So all past papers are available on the BMAP website. Obviously, the more recent past papers will be more um, indicative of what you'll see on your test day. There's also an online BMAT science guide, which you can use, use a little bit of a textbook, coupled as well with the BMAT syllabus. So what, how I went about my revision for the BMAT, for the science component at least, is I had the science guide and the syllabus, and I went through and I printed out the syllabus, highlighting the points that I wasn't so sure on, and then I just looked up those syllabus points in the, um, the science guide, and that formed my knowledge revision before I went through doing practice questions. In addition to those free resources, um, you can get additional help from courses, books, and question banks. Again, at the Medi Portal, we offer um, BMAT courses, and we have a BMAT question bank as well. If you were interested in private tuition, we do also offer that as well, and we have our bespoke package, which is where you would be allocated one um, or two tutors to offer a tailored help through your application process, and we would help you with your UCAT, BMAT, personal statement, interview, deciding medical schools, um, etc. So I would recommend that bespoke package um, in particular. So a little bit more about the resources that we offer for the UCAT and the BMAT. As I said, we've got our online courses, um, and these can be uh, self-directed, 
and we talk about the UCAT and the BMAT in those courses, fully interactive. We have an online UCAT course and an online BMAT course. Um, we have our question banks, both for the UCAT and the BMAT, thousands of questions, and they're giving you, particularly for the UCAT, which is also an online test, if the formatting of the question bank is exactly the same as what you'll see on test day. Okay, so that kind of concludes our um, summary and our, our whistle stop tour through the UCAT and the BMAT. And I know that we're back on schedule. As I said, I wanted to spend a little bit longer covering the UCAT and BMAT because they're such important parts of the UK um, application. So Devesh, I think we're probably prepared yes, to take yes. a couple of questions now, yeah, and then uh, we should be ready to start at two for the interview. And it's actually we are running slightly later than scheduled uh, uh, the next session. Uh, so actually before going ahead, uh, maybe um, I'll just take a couple of questions and then pass it back to you. Uh, no worries. I'm more than happy to, to sort of crack on and we can do the, the interview slightly quicker. I imagine about 20 minutes for the interview. So we yes. should be thereabouts. Perfect, perfect. Great. So I think we are ready to start uh, discussing about the interviews. I'll just stop this recording. Thank you for sharing information about BMAT.